Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, welcome to Isaac Pune Optics League uh, webinar. Uh, today, we are honored to have Professor Gillard Haran among, amongst us, and uh, he'll be uh, talking on uh, some aspects of single molecule spectroscopy. To give a brief introduction about uh, Professor Gillard Haran, Professor Gillard Haran completed his graduate studies at uh, Weizmann Institute of Science and received his PhD in 1993. Following his postdoctoral research at the University of Pennsylvania, he returned to the Weizmann Institute in 1998 and uh, joined the staff of its uh, Department of Chemical Physics. He's currently the incumbent of the Hilda Pomeraniak Memorial Professorial Chair. Professor Haran is a recipient of multiple uh, internationally recognized awards, such as 2017 Advanced Grant from the European Research Council, also the Weizmann Prize, and in 2019, he was awarded the ACS Physical Chemistry Division Award. In 2011-12, he also served as the chair of the National Committee of the Israel Science Foundation to the International Union for Pure and Applied Biophysics. Professor Haran, research focuses on the dynamics of individual molecules. Uh, with laser techniques, he studies relationship between the motion of molecules and their function, which is particularly relevant in biophysics where scientists study how single molecules assemble to form working molecular machines, which is also relevant to various problems such as developing drugs for diseases such as Alzheimer's and amyloidosis. Other topics of research include enzyme dynamics, super resolution microscopy of T cells, and also single molecular Raman scattering as a probe for uh, plasmonic structure. With this brief introdu introduction, I would request Professor Gillard Haran to take over and present this talk. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank you and, and your colleagues for this kind invitation to give uh, uh, this talk. I wish I could uh, do it in person in uh, Pune, but uh, that's the next, uh, the second best thing to do, to do it on Zoom. Uh, so when I uh, wrote to you that I can speak either on single molecule biophysics or on uh, plasmonics, you said, uh, why don't you talk on both? And I took the challenge and I, I'm actually going to, uh, to give basically two talks. Uh, so the first half will be biophysics, the second half will be plasmonics. And I hope that, uh, that you will bear with me and that nobody will be bored uh, by, by this talk, by either part of the talk. So let me share my screen and uh, start the talk. Okay, so as I said, I, I'm going to spend the first half of the talk talking about biological uh, machines. And the second part will be about strong coupling uh, in plasmonic uh, cavities. And I will tell you all about it and explain what I'm going to uh, discuss and, and what we see. So here's our first part, biological machines. What you see in this cartoon is uh, uh, biological machines moving along uh, a network of filaments inside the cell. And the interesting point about this uh, uh, movie is that what you could see uh, is that each of these machines has a lot of internal motion, a lot of uh, uh, movement of parts inside the machine as it operates. And this is what we are interested in. Uh, there is evidence in the literature that these, what we call large scale changes, large scale conformational changes of these machines can be very fast. So the question is whether we can actually measure them, we can actually see them on the single molecule level. The way we approach this problem is by using single molecule fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Uh, we put uh, small uh, 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 antennas, two dyes on our machine, and we look at fluorescence from the acceptor dye as the donor is excited. Uh, and this fluorescence depends on the distance between the donor and the acceptor, of course. And so in that way, we can actually look for changes in the distance between the donor and the acceptor. The, the experiment is done in solution. We uh, focus a laser beam inside the solution. The molecules are swimming through the laser beam at low concentration so that each moment of time, there is only one molecule in the beam. And we get these bursts of photons in uh, two detectors for the donor and for the acceptor, green and red. And from this, we can calculate threat efficiency for each of these bursts 
In a typical experiment, we have maybe 10,000 such pairs. So we can plot a histogram of the probability to get a certain threat efficiency uh, from these molecules. You see that this histogram looks quite complex, meaning that there are uh, many states and uh, many interesting features uh, for the way this molecule, uh, this putative molecule behaves when it goes through the laser beam. So we would like to understand these dynamics. We would like to go beyond just looking at this histogram because it's difficult to understand here what's going on. And the way we do that is by looking at uh, the uh, uh, photons uh, emitted by the molecule on the level of individual photons. We record photon by photon the emission from the molecule in two channels, as I said, green and red. And then we can analyze this photon flux and to see where we have more red photons and then more green photons and then more red photons and so on. And this tells us that there are transitions in the data between states with high threat efficiency and low threat efficiency. And this is the conformational dynamics that we are seeking to understand from the molecule. Uh, by using uh, powerful statistical methods, we can take a set of such trajectories, photon trajectories. As I said, we have five to 10,000 trajectories in, a, in one experimental set, and we can analyze them together to get the populations of the different states in the data, to get their threat efficiencies from which we can calculate the distance and to get the rates of fetal conversion between them. Uh, let me uh, demonstrate this with a quick, uh, 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 example, and then we will move to a slightly more elaborate story of one particular interesting uh, molecular machine that we, we study. Uh, so here's a small uh, enzyme uh, called adenylate kinase. We are interested in this enzyme because uh, you can see this interesting structure with two domains uh, protruding from the main core structure of the protein. And these two domains can actually change their conformation and close together in order to bring the two substrates of the enzyme uh, close enough for the reaction to occur. So Chaim Aviram in the lab put two probes on this molecule, one here and one here, and started looking at the dynamics of conformational changes using the methodology that I just described. I, should, uh, I would like you to, to remember that this enzyme operates about 400 times per second. So the enzymatic reaction uh, takes uh, uh, 400 times in one second. Uh, and the question is, is the conformational change, the domain closure, as we call it, rate limiting for the reaction, which, is, which was the suggestion in the uh, uh, literature before uh, our study. And I'm going to show you that it is not. So we did the experiment that I told you about, and we did it time and again as a function of the concentration of the substrates of the enzyme. And we found, surprisingly, we, we could, as I told you, we could get from analysis of the experiment, the rates, the rate for opening of the uh, protein and the rate for closing of the protein. And you see them here in green and red, uh, respectively. And surprisingly enough, both the rate for opening and the rate for closing increase dramatically when the substrate concentration becomes high. And we reach actually a closing rate uh, that corresponds to something like 15 microseconds. So that's quite fast for this type of motion on the single molecule level. So the question is, what is happening here? What are these motions? Obviously, these motions are much, much faster than the 400 per second that I told you that the, is the rate for the uh, uh, enzyme catalysis. So what's happening here? So what we believe uh, is happening is the following. Uh, so if you look more carefully at the active site of the enzyme, you see that in fact, the two substrates of the enzyme, ATP and AMP, need to be co-aligned very accurately in order for the reaction to occur. But when the two substrates bind to the enzyme, there seems to be nothing that guarantees that this will be the case. It could be that they actually bind in this distorted manner. And so in this way, reaction cannot really occur. So what will the enzyme do? So the enzyme opens and closes, opens and closes. Each time it opens and closes, the substrate uh, orientation changes a little bit. And in the end, it reaches the right conformation for the reaction. The reaction occurs 
the products can be released and new substrates can come in. So the uh, uh, opening and closing dynamics of the enzyme serve in order to correctly orient the two substrates for the reaction. And that's a very interesting uh, uh, application, if you wish, uh, that the enzyme has developed of its conformational dynamics in order to generate uh, a more efficient uh, chemical reaction. So that's one simple example for uh, fast microsecond dynamics and their influence on the function of a protein. Now we move to a much larger protein. Uh, this is a uh, large machine. Uh, and those of you who are of a little bit familiar with uh, protein machines, let me tell you that this, uh, this belongs to uh, the big family of AAA plus machines. Uh, and in this particular case, this protein serves to disaggregate uh, proteins to save them from aggregation. So you know that many proteins are prone to aggregation in the cell. This leads to big chunks of proteins uh, forming together. And this can be a, a reason for many different diseases. And so cells have developed various mechanisms to prevent aggregation or at least to save proteins that got stuck inside aggregate. So this is one such example. Uh, here's how it works. In this cartoon, you can see what's going on. So here's the aggregate. And this is a small uh, protein, uh, which we call the co-chaperone. And this small protein actually binds to the aggregate and then brings it to the big machine, to this machine, which we call clip B or HSP 104, it doesn't matter. Uh, and this machine, as you can see here, has a big hole in the center and it can attach to the aggregate and it can pull, forcibly pull one strand of a protein from the aggregate and thread it through the center. And when it does that, it allows this protein to be released from the other side. And this release of this protein uh, allows it to then uh, refold on the other side. So that's a, a very interesting operation. And the question is, how does it do it? So this is the structure of the protein. It is rather complex. It has several different domains. It has the N-terminal domain. It has this M domain that has been shown to be like a switch of the machine. And it has two nucleotide binding domain, meaning that each subunit out of the six of this machine actually hydrolyzes two ATP uh, molecules uh, during its operation. Uh, so uh, over the years, over the last few years, we studied several different aspects of this machine. I don't have time to speak about everything, but if you wish, you can go to our uh, publications and see how we studied the switch of the machine and uh, looked at its operation. And we also studied the N-terminal domain and found that uh, it, it, it is actually an inhibitor of the switch and it works as an entropic inhibitor. In other words, it doesn't really bind directly to the switch, but it just inhibits its operation by uh, taking space, by uh, uh, um, getting into the, uh, the space of the switch and, and preventing it from going from one conformation to the other. That's again uh, documented in the literature. And I would like to go to a, uh, another story which has to do with the actual mechanism of pulling of substrates, of substrate protein by this machine. This is a cartoon from the literature that suggests uh, a common model for the activity of the enzyme, which is uh, uh, called the handover end mechanism. And in this mechanism, each time one subunit goes up, and as it goes up, it pulls down a, a piece of the protein, and then the next subunit goes up, and so on and so forth. So this uh, model, is, which has become quite popular in the literature based on cryo uh, electron microscopy structures, uh, entails several different things. Uh, it entails that it, in each step of the machine, two amino acids of the protein are pulled through. Uh, it also entails sequential operation, meaning that all six subunits have to operate one after the other. Uh, and it all, uh, finally entails that since ATP hydrolysis is rather slow in this machine, uh, the translocation should be slow. But these uh, predictions are not borne out by actual biochemical and biophysical experiments. For example, this experiment uh, with optical tweezers that was published uh, a couple of years ago shows 
that the uh, not only uh, the pulling of a substrate is very fast, the machine can pull 400 amino acids per second, much, much faster than ATP hydrolysis. It also pulls them in steps of 28 amino acids instead of two amino acids, as I wrote here. So something seems to be wrong. Further, uh, a, another group showed that even if you knock off, knock off the activity of up to three of these subunits, the machine happily operates. So this suggests also that the sequential operation idea is not quite correct. So what is going on here? So we set to look at the activity of uh, elements inside the pore of the machine, which are called the pore loops. So each uh, subunit has three pore loops protruding into the pore. And these are the elements that are responsible for pulling in the substrate protein. So we wanted to understand the dynamics of these elements. And in order to uh, understand better what is going on, Isham Mazal in the lab decided to put probes on uh, uh, to put probes on each pore loops. So you can see here in this uh, car little cartoon, a probe on one pore loop and then another probe on a fixed position on the machine. And then we can measure the distance between these two points and understand what is going on. Uh, this is how pore loop number one out of the three looks like and the uh, position of the uh, uh, probe is here. And Isham was careful to look at the activity of the machine and make sure that even though the machine has this bulky uh, uh, fluorescent dye inside the probe uh, at that position, it does not perturb its operation at all. The operation is similar to the wild type machine. Okay, so here's how the histogram of uh, fret efficiencies looks like when we measure it for these two positions. And when we add the, the substrate protein, you can see some change in the histogram, meaning that the substrate induces some conformational change in the pore loop. Uh, this is pore loop one. When we do the same experiment with pore loop two, we see a much larger change in conformation. And also pore loop three shows a big change in the conformation when the substrate is added. So that's already quite interesting. It shows that the conformation of the pore loops, especially two and three, is very sensitive to the presence of substrate inside the uh, pore of the machine. Uh, so the question is, if you look at these histograms, I already told you before that broad histograms suggest that there is a lot of motion between different states, maybe even fast conformational dynamics. Can we see this conformational dynamics? So we uh, resorted to a technique called cross-correlation spectroscopy. You basically look at the correlation between emission of the donor and the acceptor. And if the, the donor and the acceptor are far away, there will be uh, uh, less emission from the donor and more, sorry, more emission from the donor, less from the acceptor. Uh, but when the, the, the two probes are close together, uh, more emission from the donor, less from the acceptor. So if they move like this, you will see a change uh, an anti-correlation in the correlation curve. And this is indeed what we see here. So this increasing uh, um, feature here in the correlation curve indicates anti-correlated motion, uh, which occurs on a time scale of a few tens of microseconds. So the, the pore loop is moving very fast up and down, but we already know that when we add the substrate, it also changes its conformation. So that's what we know so far. We can do a few more things. For example, we can uh, change the uh, um, nucleotide that we use in the solution. So I told you that the machine works with ATP, which is very common in biological machines. But we can, instead of ATP, uh, these are the histograms that we got with ATP, without substrate, with substrate. Instead of ATP, we can add ADP. ADP is, of course, the product of ATP hydrolysis. And what we see is that the change upon addition of substrate is much smaller when only ADP is there. We can, only, uh, we can also add, instead of ATP, a, a non-hydrolyzable analog of ATP, which is called ATP gamma S. And again, the change is much, much smaller. So this pore loop, pore loop two, in this case, is sensitive to the identity of the, ATP, of the nucleotide, whether it's ATP or ADP or some other nucleotide. We find a similar picture also 
in pore loop three, it is also very sensitive to the identity of the nucleotide, but pore loop one is completely oblivious, as it turns out, to the identity of the uh, uh, of this uh, nucleotide. It uh, has the same conformational change with ATP or ADP or ATP gamma S. We can also do some additional tricks that I don't have time to show you, mainly using um, mutagenesis in order to change the identity of one amino acid inside the pore loops and find the effect of that on the dynamics. And we find that uh, using that, we find that pore loops one and three are correlated, their, their dynamics are correlated with disaggregation activity. Uh, if the dynamics are less uh, 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 effective, then also disaggregation activity is slower. And so there is an interaction between the activity of the pore loops and the overall disaggregation activity of the machine. And of course, as I told you, there is also uh, an effect of the substrate, uh, basically on ATP hydrolysis on conformation, the conformational change of pore loops two and three, uh, while pore loop one is not sensitive to the to ATP hydrolysis. So how can we take all these observations and try to understand through them a reasonable model for the activity of the machine and for the way the pore loops are inducing motion of the substrates through the machine? So in order to do that, we need to remember two basic uh, uh, models uh, for the activity of uh, nanomachines, protein machines. The first very famous model is called the power stroke. It suggests that basically a part of the protein is primed for a conformational change. And when ATP is hydrolyzed, then immediately there is a jump of that part. Uh, it, it's kind of like a, a lever that is released uh, suddenly, and then it jumps to the, its new position. And this, is, uh, this leads to what is called the power stroke. So this is one model, but there is another model. This, the second model, which is also quite famous, so you might recognize it, is called the Brownian ratchet model. This is a ratchet here. This is a macroscopic ratchet. You have a wheel that in principle could turn to in both direction, but when this pole, this part here, uh, this cyan part of the wheel is engaged, uh, it prevents it from rotating clockwise. So the wheel can only rotate counterclockwise in this case. So this is a ratchet, but here we are talking about a Brownian ratchet. What does it mean? So here's the Brownian ratchet. Uh, it has two different uh, energy surfaces. The first one is completely flat. So the particle that is involved in the motion can diffuse in both directions. Then at a certain point of time later, one switches to another energy surface, which looks now like a uh, saw tooth structure. And what happens is that because of this structure, you see that some of the population got trapped in this minimum here. And actually some of the population already got trapped in the next minimum. While because of this very, very long slope here, there is no population that is going to become trapped in the next minimum to the left. So now we are going to do it again. We are going to switch it back to the flat uh, uh, surface and uh, the particles can diffuse back on the flat surface and we are going to do it periodically to switch between these two surfaces and the outcome of that is actually unidirectional motion to the right which is a bit surprising in the beginning because you take something which seems to be doing its equilibrium dynamics but still by uh, pulling it through these two different surfaces you can push it to uh, one, in one direction so this is a brown and ratchet and a tenet of uh, the burn and ratchet is that it has two time scales, fast and slow. The fast time scale is the diffusion, and the slow time scale is the switching between the two energy surfaces. So, can we build a Brownian ratchet for our observations of uh, uh, the threading machine and try to understand it like that? So, here's the machine. And uh, initially, uh, all the pore loops, all the three pore loops are in one conformation. The substrate protein starts to be threaded. It starts to engage uh, uh, the first pore loop. And uh, the, this pore loop starts to pull it in. And when it engages the second pore loop, the second pore loop behaves like a pole. So when ATP is hydrolyzed, the second pore loop prevents the uh, substrate 
from uh, uh, going back, it can now go only in one direction, only down the, the pore and into the other side of the machine. Uh, now, when the third pore, uh, pore loop is engaged, it also does the same. It also prevents any further motion back, but it also forcibly pulls the, uh, um, uh, the substrate in. So it helps pore loop one in pulling the substrate and uh, removing it uh, from the uh, channel of the machine on the other, but now to the other side, because the protein cannot just diffuse back uh, into the part where it uh, started its motion. So we have here a, again, two time scales. There is the first motion of the pore loops. I showed you that it occurs on the microsecond time scale, but there is also the slow hydrolysis of ATP that leads to a jump between a situation where uh, pore loops two and three operate as poles and a situation where they are, uh, they are released and they allow the substrate to swim in both directions. So again, the interplay between all these different conformations leads to a brown and ratchet like operation inside the cavity of clip B. So to summarize this part of the talk, what I showed you here is that we have the means to look at very fast motions of these little protein machines. And we have the means to modify these motions and modulate them in order to try to elicit different principles of motion. And I showed you several different examples. Uh, some of them I, I had more time to talk about, some of them less time. But the bottom line is that uh, there are very interesting new phenomena that can be observed when we look at these protein machines. And single molecule fresh spectroscopy is now ripe to uh, look at the, the dynamics and the motions even on the microsecond time scale. So that's the first part of the talk. Uh, if there is any question on this uh, first part, I will be glad to answer it now before moving to the second part of the talk. Uh, Professor Harun, uh, the time skill that you uh, talked about in the Brownian ratchet model. Uh, yes. Are those time skill uh, appear in the uh, correlation spectroscopy where you you can you said uh, some few microsecond uh, behavior is there, but uh, the longer time scale behavior uh, is perhaps not there. Yes, that's right. So we we cannot see in this experiment. We cannot directly see the long time scale. And as a matter of fact, we are now setting up an experiment that will allow us to see also the long time scale. It will require a slightly different uh, uh, experimental strategy because in our current experiment where we let the molecules diffuse through the laser beam, the overall time that we can see is of the order of one millisecond. Okay. But obviously this time scale of ATP hydrolysis is slower than that. So we will have to do a different experiment. I, there is a new postdoc in the lab who is starting to do exactly this experiment. So maybe in a year or something, we will have some results to report on that. Thank you. Okay, if there are no additional questions. I would like to ask a question, sir. Yes, sure. So I have a question from the correlation curve that you showed uh, for uh, uh, something. So the correlation was going up in first, uh, let's say 30 microsecond, and you called it anti-correlated process. So yes. I didn't understand what does it mean by, because I believe you have a FRET pair in protein and uh, you're looking at their uh, fluctuations. Yes. So, so, the, so here's the way it looks. Uh, let me try to explain it. So as I try to uh, explain, so uh, the emission from the donor and the acceptor at very short times, is anti-correlated in the sense that if they are close together, there is a, a low emission from the donor and high emission from the acceptor. But the, if they are far apart, there is high emission from the donor and low emission from the acceptor. Okay, so that the, since the emission depends on the position, they are anti-correlated in their emission. But when they start moving, then they randomize their position. So eventually, after a certain time, after the relaxation, this information is lost. So this means that it, 
because of the anti-correlation, if you calculate the correlation function at, at uh, short times, the, uh, there will be low correlation. This is the anti-correlation. I mean, there will be the correlation, actually it should be negative, negative correlation, but since it adds on another component, you don't really see it negative, but you see it slightly lower than the, let me try to go back to it. Here. So you see that it's lower than the maximum initially, and then it goes up. So as the, uh, as the motion of the protein gets randomized, then it loses this information about the anti-correlation. And that's why it goes up. Okay, if you wish, I can send me an email. I will send you some a paper that explains this in, in, in better terms. It's a little bit difficult to explain it like that. Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay, so going now to the second part of the talk, uh, as uh, Monty Python used to say, and now for something completely different. Um, oops. So we are here, we are going to talk now in, in the remaining time about strong coupling within plasmonic cavities. And I'll start by explaining a little bit about plasmonics, although I imagine that many of you are familiar with that. So this is called the Lycurgus cup. It is a cup that was uh, found in archaeological excav excavations and it origins uh, in the uh, fourth century uh, from the Roman Empire. And what you can see here is that when you illuminate the, this cup from the front, it has this relatively dull uh, green, um, green color. But when you illuminate it from behind or from inside, it has this very nice uh, red color. And this is because the glass that, from which this cup is made is impregnated with nanoparticles of silver and gold. And nano, these nanoparticles have unique optical properties. Of course, uh, they show surface plasma on excitations. Uh, if we look at a single uh, uh, nanosphere, uh, uh, we can describe the, elect the electric field on the surface when we illuminate the nanosphere. We can describe it using this simple equation. So epsilon is the dielectric function of the metal, and epsilon m is the dielectric function of the medium uh, around. And you can see here in the denominator, if the metal dielectric function is negative, it can cancel uh, the denominator and then you get a resonance. Here's uh, this, the dielectric function of silver. So around 360 nanometers, it's about minus two and it will cancel the denominator. You will get a resonance for these nanoparticles. So the resonance means that the electric field on the surface of the nanoparticle is much stronger than the uh, uh, electric field of the light that we shine on it. And if we have two particles, uh, it's becoming even more interesting because uh, the, the electric fields of the two particles add together like two dipoles, and we get in the gap a very, very strong electric field, what we call a hotspot. In fact, people have uh, been doing this with many different arrangements. You can use two spheres like I just showed you, but you could also use two uh, prisms like here, and this is called the bow tie structure, and we are going to talk a lot about this structure. And you can do many different other structures like you can see here, even a polymer of particles uh, or more complicated and beautiful structures. And each of these has its own uh, uh, optical properties, all derived from the fact that the electric, that the electromagnetic field can be basically um, focused inside the gaps between the particles. But we are going to talk specifically about uh, plasmonic cavities. I'm going to explain in a minute what I mean by this term, plasmonic cavity, but you can already imagine that this has to do with the fact that between the particles, there is a very strong electric field. Uh, we are going to put uh, quantum emitters, uh, particles that can emit light inside the cavities, and we are going to look at what then happens. Uh, this is a project that was uh, uh, done in the lab by Dr. Santos Kotny, uh, and then Dr. Satyendra Gupta, both of them uh, uh, very good postdocs from India, who are now back in different 
uh, positions in India, and then Dr. Ora Bitton, my collaborator over the years, and Professor Lev Chuntonov, a former postdoc in the lab, who is now an independent PI and continues to help us with his kind advice over the years. So before going into the plasmonic cavities, let's do a small digression and talk about cavities in general, and particularly the concept of cavity quantum electrodynamics. So this is a field of quantum optics in which you take a dielectric cavity and you put a single object inside, a single emitting object. And because this emitting object sees the strong uh, uh, electric field inside the cavity, it interacts very strongly with the cavity. And you can see what happens here. So you have the excited state of the emitter and you have the cavity mode and they mix together and they split into two new modes, which are called polaritons, upper polaritons and lower polaritons. And these two modes are split by twice the, uh, uh, the strengths of the interaction. And therefore, uh, this leads to an interesting uh, form of the spectrum that you measure. So you can see it here, the original spectrum of the emitter, emitter original spectrum of the cavity. And together you get this uh, uh, spectrum with a dip in the center, and this is called vacuum Rabi splitting. I'm sure you've heard about that before. So this is uh, what happens in a dielectric cavity. The advantage of using such cavities, and they are now very well refined in the literature, uh, they have a very high quality factor, meaning that if you inject a photon into such a, a cavity, it can bounce back and forth between the mirrors many, many times before it escapes. On the other hand, uh, the volume of such a cavity is relatively large. And another um, problem with such cavities is that their lines are fairly narrow, which means that you have to be, be very careful how you operate with them. Often you need to do that at low temperature with very accurate laser lines and so on and so forth. So uh, can we do, can we use, instead of these cumbersome dielectric cavities, can we use plasmonic cavities and do the same? So here's another example of a plasmonic cavity with two particles and the strong uh, field in the gap can make this into something that really looks like the cavity that I just showed you. What is the problem? The quality is never uh, as good as in a dielectric cavity because these particles are quite lossy. They are metal particles. They can absorb and scatter the photons. So the quality is not good. On the other hand, the volume here in the center can be much, much smaller than the volume of a dielectric cavity. So in the end of, uh, uh, of uh, the, this exercise, we can win because of the small volume. So if we look at what's called the figure of merit of the cavity, Q is small, uh, but V is large. So the figure of merit uh, is such that we can use this cavity for uh, some interesting quantum optics. So here are the ingredients uh, of our uh, uh, plasmonic cavity exercise. So as I mentioned before, we, are, uh, we like to use these bow tie structures with a gap in the center. The, the, the size of the gap is between 10 to 20 nanometers. This is the spectrum of such a cavity. And we use quantum dots. And you'll see in a minute why we chose to look at quantum dots, uh, semiconductor quantum dots. This is the spectrum of a single quantum dot. Uh, and we uh, developed a method to introduce these quantum dots into the cavities. And you can see here some examples. And this also shows you why it's very nice to use these quantum dots, because we can go to the electron microscope and we can actually count how many emitters we have in the cavity. So in this case, we have a single emitter. And in this case, on the right, we have two emitters. And in this case, we probably have up to five emitters in the cavity. So it's actually uh, very useful to know exactly, at least after we do the experiment, to know exactly how many emitters we have there and to correlate the number of emitters with the optical spectrum we get. Because obviously, the strength of the coupling also depends on the number of emitters. In fact, it goes like the square root of the number of emitters. The more emitters there are, the stronger the coupling. And this is another aspect that we would like to understand from the results. So here are some spectra, some uh, optical spectra, scattering spectra that we measure from such devices. Here's on top of a device with two particles inside. And you can see the nice dip in the spectrum. By the way, the, uh, the colored 
uh, the black line is the uh, uh, original measurement, and the colored line is due to a fit to a model called the couple oscillator model from which we can directly extract the strength uh, of the coupling uh, between uh, the emitters and, and the cavity. And you will see that these colored lines are on all the spectra that I'll show you. So on the bottom, we see three particles. Uh, one of them is a little bit off the center of the cavity, and you see that the uh, coupling is slightly smaller. We can see some coupling even when we have a single particle here, especially on the left, you can see an example of that. And even when there is no clear splitting in the spectrum, still the width of the spectrum becomes larger, indicating that we are close to the strong coupling regime. How can we prove that this is indeed due to strong coupling, due to Rabi splitting, like I showed you before? Well, obviously, when the laser uh, polarization is along the longitudinal direction of the cavity, there should be the strongest uh, excitation inside the gap of the cavity, while when the laser is perpendicular or orthogonal to that direction, the uh, coupling should be much, much smaller. So let's turn the polarization of the laser and see what happens. That's what you see here in this example on the right. So we start with the polarization uh, uh, along le the longitudinal direction, and we gradually turn it away. And you can see that the dip in the spectrum actually diminishes quite dramatically, indicating that indeed this is the phenomenon that we see here is bona fide uh, vacuum Rabi split. Can we see the Rabi splitting with other observables apart from uh, scattering of light from the cavity? Yes, we can. So this is a technique called energy, electron energy loss spectroscopy. It's done inside the electron microscope. The idea is that when you shine a beam of electrons on the sample, they can interact with the sample and they can excite plasmonic excitations and lose energy when they do that. So if we measure the spectrum of the electrons after they pass through the sample, we can figure out which energy they lost. And from that, we can figure out which excitations were made in the sample. Uh, the nice thing about EELS uh, is that you can do that locally. In other words, the electron beam is very, very small. It's of the order of uh, one nanometer. So you can scan the electron beam and measure the spectrum, the EELS spectrum at each point in the, in the uh, sample. And you can see here how uh, a map uh, of uh, electron energy loss looks at different points uh, at, at different energies uh, of loss. So from 1.5 all the way to 4 electron volts, you can see that the map looks very different. And this uh, spectroscopy, by the way, is done with the help of our colleague, Dr. Lothar Huben, who is an expert on electron microscopy, especially sophisticated analysis methods like this one. So let's look more carefully and more in detail on uh, uh, some of these modes. Let's start with the lowest energy mode that we can register at around 1.5 or 1.6 electron volts. This is the spatial map for, that we get for that mode. And in fact, if we calculate, if we do a numerical calculation of the charge density inside the particles that is elicited by putting the electron beam here at the corner where you see the maximum uh, response, uh, you can see this kind of distribution of charges uh, inside the, uh, the particle. If we uh, translate this distribution into simple terms, you can see here an arrangement of plus minus plus minus. This is basically two dipoles pointing uh, um, head to tail towards each other. So they add together and this leads to what is called the bright mode because they will emit to the far field and we will see strong response in the far field. Uh, so what happens when we put quantum dots inside such a device and we look at the excitation when we put the electron beam here in the corner and we excite this bright mode and that's very nice. We see a nice rubbish splitting in the spectrum indicating that indeed these particles, the quantum dots, are nicely coupling with the bright mode which leads to uh, uh, the dip in the spectrum. This is quite expected. It, it's similar to what I showed you using scattering spectroscopy, and it actually uh, supports very nicely our uh, uh, previous experimental results. But can we go beyond the bright mode and look at what happens at other modes 
of the cavity. So here's one more mode, and this mode is particularly interesting. You'll see in a minute why. So this is the, the mode at two electron volts, and this is the spatial distribution of this mode. And you see that the strongest um, position is in the center between the two particles. If we look at the distribution of charges, this is how it looks. So it, now it looks like the two dipoles are pointing towards each other instead of pointing head to tail like before. So the, basically, this means that they cancel each other, which means that in the far field, there will be no emission whatsoever. So there will be no scattering of light to the far field from the two electron volt mode. So this is called the dark mode now. So the question is, can we actually put particles there uh, that couple to the dark mode and still lead to uh, strong coupling as before. So we can do that now because we can put our electron beam right at the center between the two particles and we can put their quantum dots. Here's the, uh, an, an image with quantum dots and we can look for what happens to the spectrum. And lo and behold, even here, we get a significant splitting in the spectrum, which indicates that there is coupling between the quantum dots and the dark mode in this case. This is something that we cannot do with the previous experiment because the dark mode does not emit to the far field, does not scatter light. But in the near field, as we probe it with the electron beam, we can actually see this kind of behavior. So we try to understand this a little bit more with help from our colleagues from the Czech Republic, uh, Michal, Vlastimil, and Tomasz. And they calculated how the splitting will look like with different particles uh, in, in positioned in different positions in the gap. And they surprisingly found that actually one can see this coupling, even if you put the, uh, the quantum dots not in the center of the gap, but actually in the periphery of the, uh, of the plasmonic cavity. So we were quite interesting, interested to understand this a little bit more. And then we realized the following interesting uh, uh, behavior here. So when you look at the coupling of the electron beam that you shine on the uh, plasmonic cavity, uh, obviously the electron beam comes in a perpendicular direction, uh, direction to the cavity. And so you need to couple between some perpendicular component of the electromagnetic field in the cavity and the electron beam. Otherwise there will be no, no coupling. So if we calculate the out of plane field, of the uh, plasmonic cavity, we see that indeed in the center of the cavity, there is a strong out of plane field which can couple to the electron beam, like I showed you. So this is uh, very uh, simple, but what happens when we look at the in plane uh, uh, component of the, of the field? Here's the uh, uh, distribution of the in plane component, and you see that actually in the center, for the dark mode, there is barely any contribution for the in-plane field. And the most of the contribution is in the periphery of, the, uh, of this uh, structure. So this explains why uh, when we put particles in the periphery, we can get a strong uh, response. And indeed, you can see this also in this experiment here. So we found, uh, we looked through our uh, uh, examples and we found one example where the particles accidentally were in the periphery of the plasmonic cavity. And in this case, we see a nice splitting, uh, vindicating uh, the way we think about this whole story. So uh, this is uh, how we look at uh, strong coupling with plasmonic cavities using electron beams. I showed you before how we do that with scattering light and the third modality that we can use is photoluminescence. Uh, since the time is already starting to be late, I'm not going to go, I think, through the whole story of photoluminescence, but I'm just going to describe it briefly. So this is, again, uh, I showed you before the energy uh, levels of the uh, uh, particle, emitting particle, the cavity, and how they hybridize together to form two new energy levels. And there can be emission from these energy levels, and we can, in principle, uh, uh, record this emission and look at the spectrum, and we should be able to see the same kind of dip in the spectrum as we saw in scattering. And indeed, a couple of groups did exactly that. So this is an example from the group of Hecht and colleagues, where they see, you can see this weird spectrum uh, with strange shape, and they can understand it perfectly well using some theory 
and the concept of strong coupling, just like I told you. And here's another example from uh, uh, the work of Pelton and co-workers. And you can see, uh, again, a nice splitting in the spectrum. So here you see uh, the, uh, the green is a scattering spectrum and the uh, blue is a photoluminescence spectrum from the same device and they match, match quite nicely. So we started looking for photoluminescence from our devices. And you can see here an example of a device with two quantum dots. And you can see a nice dip in the scattering spectrum and also a dip in the photoluminescence spectrum. And this, uh, uh, we were quite happy in the beginning until we realized that the spectra look quite differently. So one spectrum is much narrower than the other. And to cut a long story short, because the time is already quite uh, late, I'm going to jump over this and explain here that we actually have a, an interesting situation where in these quantum dots, we also have a dark mode, just like we had a dark mode for the plasmonic cavity, we also have a dark mode for the quantum dot. And this dark mode is due to the fact that electrons can be trapped on the surface of the quantum dot and stay there for quite a long time and they get released and then there is emission, but this can take much longer time than the usual emission of the quantum dots. So this leads to a dark state and this dark state, as it turns out, can couple, oops, can couple also to the cavity. Here are the cavity levels and here are the levels of the quantum dot, the dark and the bright state. And the dark state can also couple to the cavity, albeit uh, much more weakly. But this coupling can also lead to emission from the dark state. And as it turns out, when we look, uh, when we solve such a model, uh, uh, and we do that uh, both for the scattering and for the PL, we find that in the photoluminescence spectrum, there are two, two peaks. But this peak is not due to the upper polariton like we have for for Rabi splitting, but it's due to emission from the dark state. So that's kind of a surprise that we could actually solve only by coupling our experiments with some high-end uh, quantum molecular simulations that were done by our friends uh, from San Sebastian. I should mention their names, uh, Javier Espurua and his colleagues, Thomas Neumann and Ruben Esteban. So the idea here is again, that we get emission from two different levels. One is a dark level, at least it was dark before coupling to the cavity, it becomes bright when it couples to the cavity, and then a bright mode that is the, the usual behavior as we showed before. Uh, we can, by the way, see the same behavior also in additional uh, measurements like second order correlation functions, but I really don't have time to talk about that. If you ask me about this measurement, uh, what is called Hanbury, Brown and Twist uh, experiment. I will tell you a little bit more on that in the questions. Uh, so to summarize this part of the talk, we, we showed that uh, we can see emission from the quantum dots, but this emission is more complex than we thought because of excited state dynamics between dark and bright states. But by looking at different modalities of spectroscopy, we can actually uh, couple to uh, uh, some numerical simulations and understand these dynamics. And to summarize the whole plasmonics part of the lecture, I showed you that we can observe strong coupling within plasmonic cavities, even though they are very small and the quantum uh, uh, quality factor is not very high, still they can lead to nice strong coupling with uh, uh, quantum dots sometimes one, sometimes a few quantum dots inside the cavity. And we can probe this with several different observables. And we can see interesting phenomena, bright and dark modes of the plasmons, bright and dark states of the quantum dot, and so on and so forth. We are going to try to improve this coupling in the cavities and to look for coherent interactions between different quantum dots in the near future. And this is where we are at with this uh, project right now. So I would like to thank my whole group, uh, and I already mentioned the names of people who were involved specifically in the work that I described. I also would like to uh, mention my colleague, Dr. Inbal Riven, who is the manager of the lab, and uh, several additional colleagues like Pierre Golubinov that I couldn't mention before, and sources of funding 
for the project and thank you for listening. I will be glad to answer additional questions now. Uh, yeah, Pavan, maybe you can ask the question. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much uh, for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, so uh, I have a question regarding this uh, quantum dot strong coupling uh, work, what you just mentioned. Uh, in that particular case, uh, is there a possibility that the strength of the coupling can depend on the polarization of the excitation? And uh, if yes, uh, then how would you be able to kind of use this uh, this property? Uh, for example, because of the fact that now you have an antenna, like a bow tie antenna, and uh, if you have polarization along the bow tie, then your coupling probably would be strong compared to the perpendicular. I'm just asking, I don't know the answer to this. And uh, which means that is there a possibility of having polarization as a control parameter to tune the coupling between the emitter and the antenna? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I might have gone too fast through it, but I, I, I actually showed one example. Uh, let me try to get back to that example. So this is a study where we actually tune the polarization. Yeah. And you can see that the dip in the spectrum is strongest when the polarization is along the longitudinal direction, and it becomes much, much weaker until it almost vanishes when the uh, polarization is along the uh, the perpendicular. Yeah. So a related question was, the reason why I asked this is, uh, here you are assuming that your emitter is, uh, is isotropic, right? Uh, the isotropic emitter is placed in the antenna, uh -huh. right? But now what if you break that symmetry? Because, you know, it is like... Yeah, that's a good question. I. Uh... Obviously, then then it would be best to orient the emitter in such a way that uh, it's, yeah. you know, if you have, a, a, for example, a plasmonic rod exactly. uh, coupling exactly. to the cavity or something like that, then you will have to uh, orient it in the right way in order to have a strong coupling. Yeah, that's an interesting feature. We haven't thought about that before. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. Some, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, Gilad, I would uh, like to ask a question regarding the out of plane mode you talked about in this bow tie antennas. Uh, yes. So, uh, in that context, uh, what if uh, uh, one can use a radially polarized focused beam, right? In, in which case, at the focus, you get a very large longitudinal field. Oh, which... yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, the whole concept of dark mode is is correct only if we think about you know the usual uh, dipolar light beam but if you start playing with the light beam you can actually probably excite the dark mode even though uh you you come from the far field so you you're absolutely right you can break the symmetry of the light beam and then excite it yes Yeah, actually, one of the reviewers of our paper actually said exactly that. And he said, oh, it's not really a dark mode. And we had to convince him or explain what we mean when we say dark mode. It's dark when we talk about usual dipolar uh, excitation and scattering. OK. So would this kind of coupling also be uh, be prevalent when you have, let's say, a single molecule instead of a single dot? Would you observe similar effect? Okay. I'm sorry, I cannot uh, understand the question. For example, if you had a, a single molecule in the gap of the antenna. A single molecule? Single molecule, yeah. Would you yes. uh, You'll be able to induce this strong coupling. Instead of the quantum dot, you mean? Yeah, instead of the quantum dot, yeah. 
So I think for, so one additional advantage of using quantum dots that I didn't mention is that the uh, oscillator strength of quantum dots is significantly larger than that. So the coupling for a molecule would not be that large. Actually, the, the group of Jeremy Bomberg from Cambridge showed a different uh, type of cavity where they have uh, a particle on a mirror type of arrangement. Yeah. And in that case, uh, the gap is much smaller than the gap in our experiment. And so they can fit in a molecule and they can have enough uh, concentration of the electric field to get strong coupling. And that's what they showed. And they, but the problem is that with their arrangement, they cannot prove rigorously that they have a single molecule. Yes. They can see the molecule. They, with the in our case, we can actually see them and we can see them. So, you know, there is a pro, pro and con of, of everything that you use. So, yeah. but in principle, to look at molecules, you need to somehow uh, make the gap smaller, uh, which would be difficult in our case, would be easier with our other arrangements. Thank you. So if uh, there are no more questions, uh, we would all like to thank Professor Gilad Haran for his wonderful talk. And uh, Okay, thank you very much. Yes. And hope to uh, visit you uh, sometimes in the yeah. future. Surely, surely. Yeah, okay. We keep you waiting for a day when we can actually have you here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> bye.